How does this sound? Is this too soft, too loud, just right? Just right. I see some thumbs. I see some thumbs. Our four Anthony, our hostess for the mostest, quickly wanted to see a show of hands. How many people on their name tag tonight? Got some ones. Got a few ones. All right. That one means it's your first time at Venture Cafe. And for that, I'm forever grateful that you're uh when you come back next thursday because we do this every thursday from 4 30 to 7 30 that one will become a two then a three or eventually you'll be at 103 like me and i i say this like every thursday so i'm sorry i'm repeating myself um like i mentioned out there we love to partner with the rhode island business competition for their workshop series uh teach a lot of living skills to many founders here in Rhode Island and it's very valuable. So thank you, Beth, for always working. It's incredible. Um, and tonight with all this, this is a topic that is always really popular. We have some really amazing panelists. Um, that's really enough for me. I'm going to hand it over and let the experts talk about it. Tani, and again, thank you guys so much. Thank you. When you said nothing that. Um, so please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Anthony Manger, and when I'm not being the co-chair of the Rhode Island Business Competition, I am a CPA at KOR, uh, offices Boston Province, Walton, Newport. Tonight, the, the Rhode Island Business Competition 2024 is holding um, by far most shop and, and mine those funds. And while all our workshops are super popular, uh, including our annual pitch contest, which happens in November. I will remind everybody we recently had our first student pitch contest, exclusively student pitch contest on February 20th, which was a way we had colleges and universities pitch. So I'll remind everybody to, to look for that next year. But ours, um, tonight's the Finding Those Funds um, presentation and such a panel of experts join us to provide information on the resources available to entrepreneurs. And they will tell you about themselves. And while I have the opportunity, because I have the microphone, I only thank uh, Joanne, Managing Director of DKJC Ventures, uh, Bob on Slater Technology, and Christina, General Partner at SSC Venture Partners. So I want to thank them for being part of our evening. And um, before we begin, I do want to make our sponsors, they include these services, so public agencies, colleges, universities, bank investors, and most importantly, former competitors. Um, these organizations provide support, which enables us to uh, have the competition each year. And it allows entrepreneurs that, that are finalists and, and winners to build a business framework to transform their idea into a reality. And um, seeing how this is find those funds, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask all the participants in the room um, if they knew of any potential sponsors the Rhode Island Business Company would be going after because we are always searching for funders. And so if you know of anyone, uh, Beth, please, our amazing executive director, Beth, there, you can name her away because, uh, we're, as I said, always looking to bring in more funds. Um, I did mention something. I mentioned former competitors or or sponsors of the organization. And that it is significant to note that since we were formed way back in 2000, uh, we have over 60 previous competitors that are making a huge impact on the economic development here in Rhode Island. Um, they're growing, they're expanding their businesses here, bringing employees, and um, they're buying from local suppliers and service providers. So I think I got everything. Oh, wait, in addition, I want to acknowledge uh, our partners, a couple of our partners, Venture Cafe, um, do an amazing job here. So, so happy to partner with them on our. Um, also, want to mention the Bryant, you know, marketing team, who is uh, spreading the word about us through uh, the competition, through so all the social media platforms, uh, which include Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. As we talked about earlier, for us more seasoned, mature individuals, um, ri-business.com. There we go. I got it right, Beth. It's not business.com. Perfect. Um, and difficult to mark your calendars because our awards ceremony is coming to be held on Tuesday, 
not Thursday, Tuesday, April 23rd at 5.30, right here again, partnering with Venture Cafe. Um, our application process closed last Monday, and I got a sneak peek. I can tell you we're a very range of businesses uh, that applied, and I will guarantee that will be an amazing. So I think I got everything. Okay. Um, let's move on to the workshop tonight. Find those funds. Um, I want to first have the panelists to consider so to introduce themselves. I'm going to start with immediately to my right, uh, Hank, Managing Director at DKJ. It's green now. Is it working? Can you hear me? loud i have three small kids so i don't usually need a microphone really weird for me um so welcome for braving this bomb weather my name is joanne i am here with my hat of angel investor on i've been angel invested for about 10 years now and um stop do you want me to stop there do you want to say things no go ahead right. i live in providence Amazing. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Christina Quinn. I live in Newport, uh, but grew up in Rhode Island as well, so very long on the state, uh, but I didn't for many years. And uh, I would say I moved back during COVID and really excited to be here and thrilled by the entrepreneurial ecosystem that is in process in the state, of which this type is one piece of it. So thank you to everyone on tonight. Um, my background, or rather what I do, I am a general partner at a fund, Venture Partners, um, and that is a fund that was founded by a group of BC alumni back. All different types of companies, our main thing is that you have to have at least one person on your founding team who went to Boston College. Um, and then I also have my own consultancy where my clients are primarily early stage. So beyond my own fund, I also work with a lot of other fund managers. Bob, you're up. Hey, good evening. Uh, I'm Bob Chatham. I am an adult survivor of nine star and finally saw the light and switched over to the investment side of things four years ago. Not a native Rhode Island, uh, my wife is. And so I moved here about 25 years ago. Um, ecosystem and join the Slater Fund is dedicated to building Rhode Island. So we're usually, we're a seed stage fund usually the first money into a company. And we also have another Right Hill Ventures, which is targeted at universities. Uh, so Brian alum, uh, alums, URI alums, who are starting companies, and we drill into those at age investing with them as well. So. And actually, you made me remember, I should say, SSC also has the Summer Accelerator Program. So working with college students, definitely something I do frequently, and we do our best to try to be with young time founders. So just so everyone knows, we have a great, I guess, variety there. It sounds like we have angels, venture, non-traditional uh, folks that have um, nine times, you said, Bob? Nine. So folks that have lived it, um, lived it. Scars are super. Um, so I, I guess the, the first question, let's kick it off is, um, how entrepreneur decide which type of funding to pursue? So does anybody want to take that question, kick it off, and, and maybe Joanne, maybe we'll put you on the spot. And That's fine. I'm always on the spot. Um, just for my education, how many people here have raised, like for yourself, for your company? How many people are looking to raise? I'm assuming that's why you're here. Okay, okay good. Um, so the question was how to think about raising funds or where yeah how how which avenue to pursue i don't know if anyone goes into raising a fund and say um so where should i what should i go i think they're like where do i get right like i don't care who gives me the money i want the money and this is how much i need to achieve like velocity that makes sense to me to for an inflection point um, there's so many ways to answer this question. It depends on the kind of business you are. It depends on the stage. It depends on your business model. It depends on your back. Um, I feel like I can come 20 different angles. Um, like I think the first thing that I look for, especially in an early stage, is like, have you put your own money? It's going to sound really stupid. Have you put your own money in the game? 
have you put your own time, your own invest, not money, is it time? It's like, have you done your homework? And if that's sort of like table stakes, if you haven't done your homework, if you haven't looked at your network, if you haven't asked your family, then I, you need to go do that, even your idea yet. Or it's not at a point where I'm presented to outside people who don't know who you are. Um, so that does, it's, not, it's not really answering the question, but. Um, oh, but it's good. This is yeah, but like, I, I mean, they're, they're going to want to know. They want to know how invested are you. Because if you can just walk away from that and just be like, I'm done then the, they're not going to invest in, like, you a check, right? Like, think about perspective. Um, so that's probably the first thing I would I would look at is, like, friends and you for the super, super duper early stage. Usually you have a job, like, or you have a, a job, hopefully, while you're doing this. So, you know, you can sort of pay for rent and your, yeah, and health insurance, super important. Um but yeah, that's that's where I would start. Can I pick up with the, Of course. Uh, I mean, I would say there's you've done all of the those basics. There's a, a couple of four, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in characteristics. So s different funds will have different investment pieces, and you know about what they like. And so, for example, Slater Geofocused Fund, which is kind of odd. Actually, we were a nonprofit venture capital fund, which is a little bit of a uh, kind of oxymoron, non -pro I don't know how many times in profit and, uh, and uh, under said in the same sentence. Like Non-profit. Um, we, we invest in companies that are somehow centered in Rhode Island, right? And so that's a funny investment thesis because, you know, it's just because it's in Rhode Island doesn't mean it's going to be a success. But job is to take money that from the federal government passes briefly through the hands of state and then we distribute it uh, you know according to sort of treasure capital rules like we're you know 10x kinds of returns we're looking to build high growth companies in rhode island so start a you know, what might be kind of pejoratively referred to as a business you know, really good business to have if you're into having a good lifestyle but it's not going to return 10x to your investors then there's other look Right. So kind of know that you know, sort of a bit of information about your stir, like, do they like robotics? Do they like software? Do they like hardware? You know, there's all of these different biases that people have of technology or geographic constraints that they have about their fund or, you know, it's just do a little bit of research. And if you don't have access to tools to do that, Get in touch with us because we do happy to help you. You have tools like PitchBook or Ace where you know there's usually an expensive paid version that we can help you with, show you all of the prior investments that certain paid. And so you can see, oh, they invested in a company five years ago that looked like us and they lost a ton of money on it. So they're gonna have some, you know, bias in investing in laundry businesses, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think you did a little, but I think the other side of that coin is also what is your aspiration as an entrepreneur, right? Because the type of capital that you're eventually going to seek in some ways sort of what does the finish line look like for you? Is this a business that you want to run, you know, indefinitely for the rest of your life and you're never going to want it an acquisition event? So probably not best to raise from venture capitalists, but it could be fine to raise from angels who are just looking to get some sort of return and that's early like a liquidity event. Um, and so I always, the worst thing for me is when we see an entrepreneur and they're great and they're building something really interesting, but it's actually not a venture backable business and having to explain to them like, why isn't, it's not that your business isn't great. And frankly, it's not that you're not going to be successful probably, but for the way our structure works, we need to get to a return for our LPs in about 10 years. And so if you're not looking to exit that business in 10 years, it doesn't make sense for us to give you money. So Christina brings up a really important point. Most are not venture backable businesses. Does yeah. That, yeah. Like they're not like, it's not going to ever grow to the point where for a multiple that makes sense for a fund like institutionally which is why I'm always like friends and family is usually the first money. It's like people you know, people who love you, people who are investing in you as a person, they're the people first money in. And then and then maybe you like product and it's getting some, and you're like, great, I can show that product market fit here. 
And then you can start going after angel investors groups. There's a couple of here. There's angel groups that are focused on certain universities. I went to Harvard Business School. There's a lady angels group there. I'm plugged in one with, uh, you know, some. It, it, you can you can get you can start applying to those and it's kind of seeing there's incubators that help with with non dilutive sources of funding as well. But if you're not a venture backable business, that's okay. Like the SBA is there for a reason. They're very helpful with those kind of businesses. A lot of them are like retail businesses, rest like that. Um, and RI Commerce is also very helpful too. They can like sort of point you in the right direction with those. So we'll take a question from the audience. I see a, a head shaking about the SBA not being helpful. It's and what was your experience? So great. Um, that's a great comment that there are lots of non-dilutive sources of, that are available to you, as as you mentioned, you know, SBIRs and universities. Commerce RI has a, uh, a program where if you're partnering with the university, uh, in, in, then the university to do work work for you and so there's up to seventy five thousand dollars available through these these um research grants so there are you know we have one portfolio company arcturus that's raised eight million dollars in non-dilutive funding right you know we've put a million dollars in but they've raised the majority of the money through non-dilutive funding sources through government grants and and you know so there's the other thing i'll say is friends and family is great if you're white not white sometimes friends is a great way to go because okay. you know, the average household of dollar is like on average has 20 percent of the wealth of families so friends and family is often tough you have to go to five times as many friends and family to raise money so there i were like make that case to certain kinds of investigation or you know even to you know folks like us right where you know, we are mined with the whole state as investors. And so, you know, we'll factor that into our investment decisions. So I just love this presentation because it always goes off on its own. But a couple couple points of contention, uh, not points of contention, information. SBIR is the uh, Small Business Innovation Research because I know we throw these acronyms around on people. And, and, um, and S, uh, TTR, Business Technology transfer grants yeah um and you make a great point non-dilutive funding means it's a grant you don't have to pay it back as will give you a loan you have um and then um angels venture private investors are looking for equity i think that's a big component of, of what we should talk about tonight is you know on the, the investor group where they're taking equity and the why they would want to invest in the business. And you made a great point. You know, it, it, there's got to be a return. There's a lot of business style businesses. Um, but the businesses that typically venture and angels look for are, let's call it high growth or innovative or something new, like traditional idea. And maybe, maybe it's a brand, maybe it's some sort of, um, you know, you're going to be able to fit, you know, so it's, it's tough because everybody doesn't necessarily know what to go down and friends and family are great. The holidays are a little weird sometimes. Um, so let's, let's talk about ideal that you'd like to see in terms of not necessarily it's in, but the parameters that you look for that would be investable. Let's take it. I can start. Um, so 
as alluded to, right, ours is somewhat niche in the sense that we need that Boston College connection. Um, but beyond that, it's really quite, and what I would say too is due to the fact that we have a program where we're working with students that are in college, usually recent grads, um, a lot of the time, the majority of the folks we're backing are first time thinking about like who doesn't historic funding um, I'm people who don't have a track record of serial entrepreneurship businesses yet don't always get chosen for investment. And so for us, what's nice about it is because of what our lens is and because of what we care about, my fund and my partners and I um, we are fine investing in someone that hasn't built something before. In fact, I like that because usually we get to teach them and help establish entrepreneurial foundations in that them to be a business builder in the way that we want to nurture and engage. Um, but we across the range. So I have CPG companies in my portfolio. I have B2B SaaS companies in my portfolio. I have a medical device company in our portfolio that uses quantum physics. So um, really when I think when you are a generalist in that way, the thing we have to quickly understand business models have expertise in, and then also know how to activate other people in my network. Um, in our case, it's usually BC alumni who can then go subject matter experts for the beyond working with. Um, I guess what I would note too is we don't customer fund. And so because of that, if founders that aren't in our accelerator, but are just coming to us looking for cap, um, if they're raising, usually we're participating in a round where they have a lead who can really anchor them with a bigger check size than what we can write so that they're not depending just on us to get to the business miles for the round that they're raising. Yes, yeah, so just to um, build on that, we are typically lead. So what that means is we will work with you to set the terms. So we'll put to get, put a term sheet in front of you, which is typically what we do is an instrument called, you may have heard about. So simple agreement for equity is safe. Um, that's a promise that you will give the investor as equity at some point in the future. Convertible debt is a little more attractive to angels because it um, rises to the top of the repayment stack. So remember, 10 of these startups will really pay for the investors. So they're rolling the dice on every single one. And you know what they would like to do at some point is get some of their bait back. And so debt gets paid off before you know these safes just evaporate. Um, you know, when the company goes, so we use convertible debt, um, that's, and we'll set the terms with you and we'll help you find other investors. Like the, one of the preconditions of it is if we put $500,000 in, we have to find $500,000 of matching invest to find 500 of matching investment to go alongside that. Cause you know, our goal is to grow companies here and stimulate and that kind of thing. So, you know, you need to come under you know how this whole process works and they'll help help guide you through it as as uh, you know first time founders but um you know there's a fair amount to learn about uh what goes on here i think um being um in this back to the original point of understanding who you're talking to and who's sitting in that chair you if that investor is only investing in BC alumni company. You don't have anyone on your board or your board of advisors who's a BC alum. Maybe don't waste your time with them. You know, if you're talking to me and um, I tend to focus on all and um, diverse companies with founders and advisory boards that have that component to them, um, it's white guys, I'm going to be like, like literally, I'm like, dude, you, you guys aren't trying very hard. Like, what are you doing? Um, so I think, you know, that education piece is very important. Um, at the stage that I invest in, which is at the angel stage, I'm really in person, right? The thing you come to me with is going to change. Your model is going to change. The way you execute is going to, team is going to change. So I need to know if you are the right person, lead the charge. And that's what I'm, in. I'm saying, can this person maybe pivot will they be flexible will they like do whatever it takes looking at first i want to know that you understand the market i want to know that you understand if there's ip involved that you really have that under control 
I want to know your exit strategy. Like, how are you going to get it? How am I going to make money? Right? Like, that's, they really want to know, like, how, what's in it for me? Um, so you have to address, um, but yeah, at the, at the end of the day, I think if you don't do your research into what, what they're looking for and what they're with and like, then um, it really behooves you to do that. Easy to do that fully or like just look at their LinkedIn and who's on their LinkedIn, what colleges they went to or what they majored. It's all online now, I feel like. Yeah, we boil it down to team tech traction, right? So there's broad categories that you can come to us with evidence of progress, right? So you show up as a fully famous Somebody who understands the tech, somebody who knows how to distribute it to, to the market, you know, how to run a business, right? That's, that's, you know, sort of our dream is that fully from walks in the door, which happens never. And then there's the, the technology, which is like, you know, how far along are you in developing it? Do you have a prototype? Have you written the software? Have you built a prototype of the hardware, you know? And then that's the really important part, which is, what kind of engagement have you gotten with the market? Do you have people who are actually using this? The, the, probably the biggest hurdle to overcome in the early stage is what evidence is there that somebody is going to buy, like that it's a hair on fire. Somebody wakes up in the morning and goes, oh, shit, I wish I had one of them. No, you have one of those, right? That's like our dream is that you walk in with evidence of mine. So think of it as this kind of like three-term equation, and you can solve for two of the three, but not the third one. We'll help you with the third one, one way or the traction is sort of the big one that you want to have nailed in some way, you know, in terms of evidence for demand for the product. So if your business idea is a nicety and not a necessity, um, probably don't start with Bob is what I'm reading. <laughs> Just hard. Hey, right. And, you know, you hit the nail on the head, though. I mean, it, it, it's the value proposition. Um, that's really the key. But you all just shared a lot of information about what I was looking for, and that, that's great information. But, you know, if someone's walking into their first meeting, you're not going to be able to get all that information out in the first meeting. What are the key points that somebody needs to bring to you in a first meeting to keep you engaged? Anyone want to volunteer? I volunteer, Bob. <laughs> uh, let's see. I well, I mean, I guess I you know we start rubric and like come in and tell me a story about you know. There's your your value proposition for your product here about your platform X that it does this you know three times the competitors. I want to hear the story about. You know, I was a robotics engineer working at Amazon, and we used to have problems with these robots all day because they were running into their, you know, they were dropping packages or something like that. And we figured out some way to solve this problem, right? It's just, you know, there's a story about how you decided to spend the next 10 years of your life doing what you're about to do. And we want to know that story and the, the extent of straights and understanding of what you're about to get into. And then after that, you know, we can fill with the details of you need to do it and you know, does it actually work and that kind of thing. I think you heard it from all three of us in different ways, but proper preparation. So knowing it's in the, is it somewhat about knowing the person you're talking to and understanding what might be interesting to them. Um, some of my career has been spent in sales. A lot of what I do outside of investing is coaching people on fundraising. And um, the simple task is take a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle, and on one hand, put all the things you're trying to figure as you as the person you're meeting. And on the other hand, you think, and then cross out your side of agenda. That usually leads to a better. Um, but I think as well, uh, I'd echo, uh, it's about a person or say product, meaning, does the product actually have traction in the market? But I also think it's very important to demonstrate founder market fit, meaning are you the who undeniably has to build this business? Why are you the person to work on this idea relative to anyone else who could be doing the same thing? I think that in many cases, as you've all heard to say too, at the earliest stages, it's a lot of fun. And 
seeing that connection point or why your background, why your passion, why your lived experience, you the right fit for the problem you're trying to solve, I think ultimately is what is most convincing to me, um, especially in the first meeting. Yeah, I think this um, idea of traction is really important. People in the lab or in the workshop or on their computer and just perfect right before they sell it or someone and I'm like it's never going to be perfect and that's okay because you should be iterating you should be like working it's going to improve on market feedback uh, but I want to still out there will pay for it that's what I want to see and if you can show me like hey so pay for you know if you let's you I have a a portfolio that does insurance technology like me that there are actually insurance that will pay like do a pilot with you, like with the beta product the answer was yes okay that's a pretty good in your column kind of thing and um feedback to people i'm like it's like you need to it sounds great but you haven't so like put it out there and, and then get feedback and then then tell me to be Paul shooting for here at the beginning. You don't need this product or idea to get out there. And, you know, I, I like where we're going with this because I, I think most entrepreneurs would think they have to be at that A plus stage. So, all of you have experience. What's the common mistakes you see entrepreneurs make when pursuing? Who wants to volunteer? I. I'll take it and maybe there's more I think sometimes thinking that goal is to get everything you have the person about your business and about who you are and everything you're figuring out in the one meeting the goal of your first meeting kind of Pinterest to get a second meeting to um and I think it can be hard in the moment to feel like it's sad of just like oh, I have to want to talk to me another time but um remembering that as it a little and it may stakes are a little bit lower you don't have to solve everyone's problems in that first conversation. Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I would much rather see a well-told story. I mean, it's, you probably have a, Think about putting things in the appendix. You know, if we want it, like if your one hour meeting turns into a two hour meeting and we decide to go deep at that point, it's great to have it as backup, but I wouldn't, you know, feel like you got to get it all out of the front. I mean, you want to have a summary. I mean, of course you have it all in your head, right? So if I ask you a question about like, what do you think the TAM for this product is? You'll know it because you've done the math and you know what your 24 month burn rate looks like and all of that's, you know, we don't necessarily have to touch on all in the first meeting. I would add too, like send the deck ahead of time, don't lightning the deck prevent you from doing the meeting. I've seen that happen to people. They're like, oh, like I'm not going to reach out until I've got the deck done or I have one more thing I need to do. And um, you remember you're in control when you're presenting. You don't have to show anyone the deck if you don't, if you want, don't want to take it in. So, um, asking questions, saying, do you want, would you like to see materials to prepare what things would be most helpful for you as we have this conversation? Doing that in advance can give you a little more control over the situation and then you're not wondering like, oh God, like what if I don't have a full financial projection? I think one of the best um, of prep material in advance, one or a two page really dense summary, that's super helpful. Right. It's got it all boiled up because the likelihood that I'm going to, you know, go through maybe, but, you know, that would assume, a, you know, fair amount of prep on my part. But uh, like, I love really, dense, really good executive summaries. I mean, think about the Wall Street Journal, right? Like, you know, you know, people think, oh, it's too crowded. But no, it's like information dense. You know, there's a funny story. There's, you know, great headlines. There's a summary of all the stuff that you can dig deeper. Just think about that as a sort of model for what a good executive summary looks like. It's a really great point. I like yours, the single spaced two pagers. It's, it's really like, this is the product. This is who I am. This is how I mean, the cap. This is like all the important things that someone would need to know. 
instead of, and I have to go, which PowerPoint was that and which email was that and, and then searching for, um, I will say it's very interesting because every deck I see is, well, if we only get 1% of the total market, I, I, literally every deck, I'm like, what is that? maybe not put that, but. Uh. Also, like financial projections up, a thing we talk about, but I'll say that to my founders. So I'm like, this is great, an upward hockey stick, but anyone can project those numbers. They tell me, why are we getting there? That thing, and you can talk to me about it. Show me the yeah. stories are super powerful. Listen, I talked to so and so who is like an ideal client, and they really want to bring this on, and you know, they're willing to test this out. That, okay, that captures my attention. So things like that are like concrete that So fair fair question. <laughs> I mean more like have you well what we like to do we like to actually talk to some of your prospective customers so the conversations may not all be with you but i in order for investment committee and to put my reputation on with them i want to have talked to four to five people who might be prospective customers of of your product or maybe i'll go to a couple of sub experts you know we invest in laundry bit alzheimer's drugs so I, I don't know anything about any of those, so I, I count on 150 people that do. So I got to have conversations with them. So, you know, maybe it's like three conversations with you and we'll do a session on the model or something like that. And we'll have, maybe have a follow-up session and then I'll have five or six conversations with other experts about the investment before, you know, we really can run it to ground and decide, yeah, that we want to back this. Okay, uh, so we're probably not quite like that. Um, I would say for us, it could be one meeting, be years of meetings, right? Because I'm investing some students and really young people who are still in college. So there are entrepreneurs that I've known for several years before we actually write the check. That being said, we're a pretty lightweight investment class. We meet every week. Sometimes we hear a pitch, sometimes we don't. And we've been known, our goal is because we're not a lead investor to also not run of time from the founder, given that they're raising from a bunch of different people. And so we try to be respectful of that and have a relatively efficient process whereby after one of us has screened the company, we have them come in and pitch to all of us. And then after that, unless we have further diligence, we really want to go down, we're making a decision within the next week or two. Often the difference between a lead and a follow-on exactly. investor is like we as leads, we are rotation on the line when we go to other people because again remember we're going to put 250k in we got to get 250k from other people in the in the community and so we're out there repping this deal to them so we have to understand it really well yeah ours with we have investors their money ours to manage and we don't have to check with to the round around us essentially we're just deciding write you this 100k check right now and all in the four of us say yes we're good we would love to have them. <laughs> Oftentimes what happens with me is I'm investing in a, in a SPV, a special purpose vehicle. It's just a separate like legal entity that is investing for this. It's not like 50 names on a cap table. Um, so there's usually investor, angel investor who is significant or from a strategic company. Um, so because it's just me. I, I, if it's a no, I like to tell them right away. I really do. Cause yes. I don't want to waste your time. Like that your time is really, really important. And I want to be respectful of that. No, this is just not for me. Like for whatever reason, I tell them, right. If I'm interested, then we'll probably have like two calls, but then I make a decision very quickly. Um, so, so Bob, I have two small roommates that tell me they're busy learnings and they don't want to do laundry. So I know a lot about laundry if you need help there. Um, we've all brought up some interesting items where it, it's more than the funds. You you sound like you could really help or navigate the, the path. So let's talk about the role that a funding source or an angel um, 
can provide above and beyond just funds, guidance, advisory. I know you mentioned, you know, the special purpose vehicle. Um, so talk about some of the the roles that that can to help that business grow outside of just giving you cash. Oh, absolutely. I I think the one is they can introduce you to other investors who they've invested before previously with and are like-minded. And most of my deals come from other people I trust. Like that's the number one way I source people is like, okay, you are vouching for that person. If Bob is vouching for this person, then I will spend an hour of my time and talk to that person. No, it's true, right? Because you only have, what, so many hours in a day. So there's the introduction to other people. And then if you're smart, you use your investors and your advisors really well. I really need, let's say, your fintech balance sheet because we're doing blending. Like, does anyone, do you guys know? And I'm like, yes, actually, I do know someone. And then you make those introductions. So, and then there's like specific ask hiring, whether it's for um, strategic customers. Like, like I, I, I'm trying to, once I have skin in the game, then I'm trying to help any way I can, like executing by any means. But I am like, I, I want them to ask me like, and if the answer is I can't help, but I might be who can help, then that's the answer. That, that important point that once we the company, we are on the same table as the company, right? Because we have to go collectively out to subsequent follow-on investors. And, you know, it's basically us and, you know, them at that point. So it, you really, you know, need to bond with her um, and, you know, use them, uh, you know, use them in that way. Because especially at the angel stage, that's why people are doing it because they love starting companies. They love seeing entrepreneurs succeed. You know, they want to be where, there with you for years while it's this thing off the ground. And I think this question makes me laugh a little because they're that um, in venture capital, it's like, we'll add value. Um, but I think as well, the connection point is spot on. Um, trying to see sits upward it might be someone who's investing in you at the pre-seed or early stage here but who's going to get you that next round or rounds into the future and having those relationships or having someone who can even give you feedback on how you're positioning yourself now relative to years ago when you were maybe at a very different stage with the business i think is a way that someone can help um more and more too, I would say, as the venture capital market has expanded funds in the market, um, there's been a shift of several funds that are led by people who are raiders, so people who have founded tech companies themselves and really care about, say, market or it's in um, a particular like sector of technology. And so that type of investor is initially upon what does someone specialize in or where do they, what do, they do? Um, what I think really knowing can be of value to you is actually a really important part of that conversation if you're raising from someone, which is how do you care to support the best in and it's aligned with what you really want and the things you're going to bring or need help and support on in the future. So what we've heard is that um, really morphed with investing and, and I'll share with you that we were the Rhode Island business plan and we required a full business plan. And then we dropped plan from the name and we went to the round business competition. And then the follow on was we actually dropped the full business plan requirement and we go to the deck. Um, I can tell you, I've looked at a lot of plans. I've looked at a lot of, I wanna go back to one thing and, and see everybody on the panel's face. Um, Cause I know for me, which is an automatic no, when, when somebody says there's no competition, um, what are your automatic no's? Like the company we wouldn't. Yeah, if somebody comes to you with something, what's in, we go back to that common mis automatic no where you see it and you know it doesn't matter how great the uh, the business written, it doesn't matter um, if they put their own money in, knows there's no competition, they've they're not fully knowledge everything. So one, it's, it sounds a little mean, but it's not uncommon to see, I have this great idea, you write me a check for a million dollars, right? I mean, that's sort of a like naive understanding of how this process works, right? So that's a no to, to start. It's like, uh, you know, I mean, I, it's a little dumb, but. 
I think for me, because I'm working with first-time entrepreneurs a lot, I'm okay if someone doesn't quite understand. I would need them to really come they need a million dollars and explain to me why, and then also I actually them from our fund. Um, but I think for it's a it's a people someone in a meeting. If someone has that they're in the room with and like they demonstrate that they're not treating that person respectfully or there's a lack of equity in how the team is formed, right? There's just something at play that doesn't feel like something to be affiliated with for because that's about when we're talking about investing out of a fund. Um, I think that and then a big thing for us at SSC is we look at adaptability and coachability. If someone's not going to be open to pivoting their idea that's slag or if i don't think that they're going to have lower ego to the point where they're going to be able to bring other people on board and recognize they're going to have to give up equity you're going to have on being the person in charge of every decision um non-coachability for me would be a no as well i agree you both said and i think um, this doesn't happen as much anymore but there was a time not ago where x and they would have the kind of a product and they would be our pre-25 and I'd be like, why? <laughs> like, why? Like, and it's like just because we feel like it. I'm like, all right, okay, hold on. So th I don't see that as much. You guys probably remember that when there's so much. I, I would attain yeah. that value. Of yeah. Um, so that kind of teach. hubris is like, um, it, I see it, it's like it's very cyclical, right? It'll come when there's city and there's a lot of funds chasing um, companies. Um, and when that happens, I'm like, I no, I'm, part, I'm not going to be part of this. Um, but I don't, none of you guys are going to be like that. I'm sure of that. Well, not only too, because it's really hard to convince someone if they've in their head decided that that's what their business is. If it proves to not, or other people don't agree with that, hard to convince someone that something they've built isn't that. And that just takes a lot of time. So, so as a dumb accountant and an, um, how would you determine what a reasonable valuation is? Well, that's why you do the convertible debt, right? Like, how do I value it? Oh, we'll figure it out. And here's a cap. And like, that's a, that's like something to negotiate. Yeah, although the, um, so the notion of a cap is a little bit of a proxy for the valuation, right? Because it's saying we won't pay any more than this for the, the equity. Not quite kicking the can down the road. Um, I think I look at it more in terms of like will we collectively have to sell to other investors because you can come to me and say i want to do this convertible note with you know a five percent and a ten million dollar and okay i mean i like your business but do you think we can go find another 500k that's going to buy into the, those kinds of terms i get to kind of push that question into the sort of larger audience of like, do you think you can find other, put that up? If you can, God bless you, right? Like, and you know, go go for it, right? It's more of a like collective, you know, realization of like, what's a reasonable valuation, well, valuation or terms that we can get other people to sign up to, because that's what I have to do, basically. And I like to remind people, it's a math equation at the end of the day, right? Like the cap, plus however much money you're raising on is going to determine what percentage of equity in your company you're giving away at that time. And so there have been times where we've passed because I look at it and I say, I don't think that's enough money to get you around, but you're not like the cap you're trying to put on this isn't going to make sense for more money, too much of your company. And I try to remind people of what the math is. Yeah. And the, the most important thing about like trying to go out with too high a valuation is remember your job basically double the value of this company at every round of finance way you avoid dilution right you you know you have to sort of like be headed on this monotonically increasing upward slope of value and it's a little easier to start low at reasonable valuation and then work your way up than it is to start really high and then you know maybe do a flat round. Um, so take that into consideration too. And by the way, if you have questions about how convertible instruments work, just let us know because we have all kinds of tools that will show you the impact and you can model this, you know, out your wazoo or whatever until, you know, you, you are satisfied, like you really understand how these terms work. You've talked the balance. Oh, do you have a question? Question, then you're the first person to ask the next question. 
So just because I'm thinking about this, because a couple of things you said, you, you talked a lot about balance in terms of going out and fundraising and not raising too much because you might be giving up too much equity. And then you talked about, well, do you have enough this round to get to the next round? Um, you know, the, the, the thing I see on trusts, they kind of say conservative would be different. Like I only need 200,000 when they really should be raising that 500,000. There's not really a lot of fun in fundraising, and you constantly be fundraising. You want to be growing your company, and and so how do you balance that? As an investor, how would you balance that? I think I think an entrepreneur is always kind of fundraising. Always like they may not be actively thinking like, oh, I have to raise X, comma, you know, zero 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 zero. But they're always sort of in the, like, they're always talking, they're like, because you might not be the right investor now, but you might be the right investor down the road. Or you might know someone who's the right investor now, or you might know a strategic who's entering with you and maybe acquiring you in the future. So you never know. So you're always sort of like, yeah, like, and if someone comes in and they're like, the CEO, if you're in FinTech and the CEO of PayPal like wants to give you money and you're like, no, your money, you're gonna take their money. So, I mean, um, but I do see that like 200,000 and needing 500,000. If you need 500,000, ask for the 500,000. Like make it very clear your source, like what, what you're going to use it for and how that. Yeah, I think use of funds, right? That's what you have to think about. You got to remind them, what are the metrics for every round you should have in mind? Not just what you're trying to do with it, but what are you trying to achieve with it, right? Not just like, I'm going to hire someone and so this is their salary. What does hiring allow you to unlock AI perspective? What are you going to be able to product because you've hired that person? I think taking it that next is very valuable and then pricing and growth. Yeah, you might have a burn of K a month today. So maybe 12 to 18 months of runway is X, but remember you're going to hire more people or you're going to have more customers to service. So given the growth you're trying to achieve in the next 12 to 18 months, how much more money do you actually need to achieve that type of growth or like things you're trying to accomplish? Yeah. The, the, you know, 24 to 36 month monthly off plan is a really important part of this discussion because it shows like you've grounded your story in the milestones that are represented here and so that makes it go a lot easier when the pitch deck agrees with the model agrees with the, agrees with the milestones and we see left you're going to raise a million bucks and you're going to be left with 250k just in case you're going to raise series seed or whatever so that when when you see a good plan like that really great facilitator for the conversation or and it's not a trap right it's more wanting to see how that person thinks about it and knowing they had mind and walk you through different scenarios i think that to me is how i think oh that person knows they thoughtful. they're not just picking a number and saying yeah, i could probably do it for that much so um um let's go to audio if you know you had a question sir let's get So normally that's where leaders come in, like you port from an incubator, you enter the Rhode Island business competition and, you know, you take first prize in that and you get 25K or something like that, or you write a grant, you know, a foundation or whatever, and you, know, you get that sort of bootstrap phase going. I mean, and there's no shortage of incubators, there's no competitions. I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I, I don't see Charles here anymore, but 
Charles, who, who started a one-handed game controller company, is the master of that kind of funding, right? And so you should definitely meet Charles and talk to him about his there. It does kind of sound like you're talking almost like an entrepreneur in residence role, um, or sometimes too, if your service could be valuable to say other companies in a funds portfolio, sometimes there are these for that type of like partner um, say, and it's probably not fully applicable at the stage you're at yet, but revenue backed finance, revenue based financing, that's something that we haven't really talked about for the recurring revenue model. There are ways that you can get non dilutive funding in terms of what your business is making every month. It's usually businesses that have that sort of subscription or something that's a monthly big, but that's something to think about like down the line as you grow. Also, congrats on your launch. Um, let's stick with the audience questions. Yes. So I never recommend that one right off the bat. You guys, like, what are you trying to learn about? More like business or the fun? I think Dr. Seuss already wrote it. It's called um, There, There is no point A to point B. I think you got to learn it. You got to. The well, there are too many books on it. Yeah. Um, if you want to get tactical, I think Venture Deals by Brad Feld is like, quite a good one it's very dense though like it is legal language you're really digging in it's not a light bedtime read you're going to want to be like paying attention to sit down to have a cup of coffee and like dig in there's no shortage of like seed stage investor yeah. blogs that will describe the process like i think you want something at theater you know there's like god's own number of websites that you know talk about this process and i would 